Superman? Batman? Daredevil? Hulk? Captain America? Spider-Man? And then of his course is Magnum Opus, Kingdom Come! Oh, pardon me. <laughs> so he's the winner of multiple Eisner and Harvey Awards, and he's a legend who keeps the hopes of millions of comic book lovers flying. It's a day of extreme honor for us to welcome Mr. Mark Wade. And on stage for his exclusive session, he'll be have a conversation with Akshay Dar. Do you get this mic? Excellent. All right. All right. We're good. There you go. Hey, I'm actually really honored to be here, and I think I'm probably amazed I'm still awake and haven't passed out on the way up. No, please. It's my honor to be up here, and it's an honor to be to be quizzed by you. By all means, please. I am I am an open book. Whatever I can whatever I can answer, I feel free to. Uh, if you don't mind, I've actually got a nice long list of questions because That's I've fine. been following your work for many years now. That's fine. Um, I think I'm just going to try and start simple. The stuff that people most know you for is a lot of the work you did at DC. Yeah, I think so. So um, you worked on a lot of things. But before, th I think what most people don't know is you started as an editor with them. Yes. Um, and you worked on books like uh, Gotham by Gotham Gaslight. Gotham by Gaslight and uh, Secret Origins and... and, and uh, I mean, yeah, several. But Gotham by Gaslight was one of the books I edited while I was there, yeah. So, um, I, from what I understand, this was one of the books that started what DC calls the Elseworlds. Right. Which is alternate reality. So, I mean, was that something you guys were hoping to work on, or did that just... We, it just on? fell into place. What happened was I was working on an anthology title called Secret Origins, which, was the or, which were the origins of Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman. Whatever. But the thing is, after four or five years of that book, we started to run out of characters. I mean, we were already told Batman's origin. We'd already told Superman's origin. So, it occurred to me why don't we start telling the origins of the characters if they happen in different times? If, if Superman had landed in Russia or okay. if Batman had been, you know, 100 years previous. And uh, it became such a popular idea that rather than just keep it within that anthology book, they decided DC asked for us to spin them out into separate titles. And that's what became the Elseworlds line. Okay. Well, I think that is, uh, most people didn't really realize it started off with something this simple. You know? Yeah. I think most people assumed it was this large planned out thing. No, like, no, no. Companies no, most now. things in comics just start out very simple and they, they grow into big plans. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. So um, after that, I actually just wanted to refer the next big thing which people know you for is, of course, yeah. The Flash. Aw. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. There you go. And it was, a, it was a huge honor to work on that book. I... What, it, what most people don't remember was that... The, has anybody ever seen the American television show, The Flash? It was okay. Uh, it wasn't great. But it was, it was on, and then it had been canceled. And so while DC had been publishing Flash for a long time, the sales, once the TV show went away, really started to slide. Okay. And there was talk about how long the book might last. And I was still new in the freelance scene, and one of my best friends up there was also the editor. And he said, well, we may as well give it to Mark because nobody else really wants the book because they think it's just going to die. I hope to get there with Daredevil someday. But right now, that's the record. Yeah. Uh, the Daredevil I'm going to get to a little later on. Sure. But um, if I can stick with this one for a while. Uh, sure. One thing that I was really fond of personally was in this run, you introduced Impulse. Yes. Which is a character I think in the beginning nobody really liked or really knew that well. Right. But suddenly now, you know, as part of Young Justice, as part of the Teen Titans, it's grown into a, a sort of a franchise by itself. Yes. Us. So was, I mean, how easy or hard was it to make a new character like that? It was, it was, it was easy to come up with the basic idea, which was the, the kid from the future who was the descendant of Barry Allen. Um, but spinning him off into his own character in his own book was not... It, that happened almost overnight. What happened was we were coming up, we'd introduced the character in issue 92 of Flash, and we were going to do issue 100 coming up, and what we were doing up to that point is we were trying to fool the readers into believing that, that Wally West was going to be gone and that one of the other characters would be stepping into that role as Flash. Okay. And we knew that, you know, we didn't want to tell the fans, but we knew that Wally West would come back and all the other characters like Jesse Quick or Max Mercury or Impulse, some that I sort of created yeah. for that era, 
um, they were around. We, uh, what happened was the marketing department came back and said three or four issues before issue 100, they said, well, we, Impulse seems to be a good character. We'd like to give that character his own book. Okay. And we thought, well, that wasn't the plan. I, I, <laughs> we, I mean, we were flattered, but I didn't realize that we were going to get his own book. So having to create his whole backstory and his whole relationship with Max Mercury and all that stuff almost overnight. Um, okay. but, but I was lucky to do But look who I was lucky to do it with, an, an artist named Umberto Ramos. Yeah, he's actually really big on Spider-Man yes. very recently. And he's just sensational. He was just, and it, this was his first big American work, and it, it okay. really, he really took to it. Yeah. Nice. Okay. And I think, um, with, if I could stick with the Flash for a minute, um, yeah. one thing that I think stood out when your time writing uh, Wally West yeah. was that you brought a little bit more science fiction and a little bit more the things that uh, was popular in the earliest Flash comics back to the Flash. Yeah. So was that easy? Did people take to that? or they, they, I think they took to that after a while. I mean, at first there was resistance that we were very, we were very much against the trend of, of dark and gritty and sort of violent comics of the era, and we didn't okay. want to do that. Yeah. We just wanted to keep it pure science fiction and have some real optimism to the, to okay. the feature. Uh, but I was always a big science nerd in school and I, I studied physics in high and in college and I, I I always love taking science and, and applying it into these stories. I can relate to that even though I was horrible in science at school. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I think what I'm gonna move on from this to one of the other things that a lot of people might know you from which is uh, Birthright from yeah. Superman. Ah uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll be honest with you this yeah. is one of my favorite versions of the Superman origin. Thank you. Um, but I think they, it didn't uh, actually last as long as some of them in terms of part of the Superman canon. Right. I was a little. I mean, I was a little disappointed in that. They, what happened was DC came to me in, a, in trying to was it 2001, 2002, somewhere along in there, and they said we would like you to relaunch the Superman origin for the 21st century. We like okay. to contemporize it and make it feel a little bit more modern. But they knew I was the guy to go to because I love Superman more than anybody else in the world. And so I was very protective of the legend. Okay. But still, I had to, I really, it caused me to rethink every single thing about Superman. Everything. Why does he do what he does? Why does he wear a costume? Why doesn't he wear a mask? All these things were questions I asked myself and sort of wrote down before I even began building a story. Okay. And the thing that I most had to bear in mind is that in the states certainly uh, Batman is considered the coolest superhero and to a lot of people in the states Superman is dull and boring because he's not all evil and dark and you know shadowy and so my task was to explain to readers or show readers why Superman was a character that you could empathize with and care about whether or not he was invulnerable. And, and I, think, I think we did a pretty good job of that. I think that, so I'm very proud of the way it came out. I think you're right, because I think one thing most people have problem with as far as Superman's concerned is that he's almost godlike. How right. do you make that character relatable? Right, but the, answer, but the answer is because, well, there's, there's two answers, actually. The first answer is because even though he's invulnerable and even though he's super strong, he's still, he's still compassionate. He still yeah. has a very human heart. So the way you attack Superman is you attack him through the heart because he's as vulnerable as anybody there. Yeah. And then also when it comes to relating to the character, that's not Superman's job. You're not supposed to relate to Superman. You're supposed to relate to Clark Kent. That's True the enough. reason he was created as a character. That's the character that we, sh that we all feel like we can identify with because we all know what it feels like to whether we wear glasses or whether we, you know, whether we're short or whether we're not the physical idea, we all want to believe that if they could just see the real of us inside, Definitely. you know, they would, they would, they would love us and admire us. So that's something that everybody can relate to. And in Birthright, you actually focused on the journey of Clark Kent when he yeah. traveled around the world. Yeah. And I think uh, one part I liked, which I wish they had kept, was the. He has the ability to see people's in a sort of life energy, I, in a manner of speaking. But you know what? I caught so much crap about that. Like, it, 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 yeah. no one in the States liked it. Everybody thought it was horrible. And I was just so disappoint, disappointed because I thought that made sense to me. It's not that Superman can see life auras or souls or anything like that. But if you have that superpower where you can see ultra 
ultraviolet and infrared, and you can see things in the spectrum that nobody else can see, it makes sense to me that living things would have a different sort of glow about them than dead things. They would just look different to you. Definitely. And it's something that I took from uh, a Superman novel written by this man named Elliot Magan, who wrote okay. comics in the 70s. And he wrote this beautiful passage in a Superman novel where he talked about how the way Superman sees things, all living things, whether they're plants or animals or what have you, they all have a certain sort of glow about them. And when they die, he it just fades to black and to Superman who's the only person who can see this it is the most heart-wrenching ug like, ugliest most repulsive thing he can see and Imagine. so he treasures life that way that the, the watching the light fade as something dies just really hurts him like yeah, inside I can imagine <laughs> yeah so I, I really like so I tried to bring that in with birthright they, they weren't that didn't stick but what I'm pleased about is when, when Man of, the movie Man of Steel came out yeah. um, I wasn't a big fan of the, of the ending yeah, wasn't, that I wasn't my exactly favorite part but there were things that they took from Birthright that they put in the movie that I was very pleased with, the idea that the S is a symbol f that stands for hope for yeah, instance that's true. Um, these are things that I'm, that as somebody who grew up reading Superman and loved Superman all his life, that if I it just it fills me with pleasure to see that certain things that I contributed to the mythology seem to have, you know, gone on and, and sort of taken root and become part of the overall mythos. That's very flattering. All right. Let's hang on a sec, sir. Sure. Okay, but, uh, we just need to make a small interruption in the session. Sorry. Uh, we, uh, it's just an announcement to tell people, please take care of your wallets and belongings. And please keep moving in the aisles. Uh, don't block the flow. Uh, this is a police order for us. That's why we need, needed to okay. interrupt the session. I'm really okay. sorry about that. So uh, please, people, take care of your wallets and all your belongings. And please keep moving along. Thank you. Except you. You can stand here. That's OK. You, you guys can stand right there. All right. Uh, so I'm actually going to start moving on from Superman because okay. we could talk about this almost okay. forever. But I could talk about Superman for days, yeah. so it's probably best if we move along. Yeah. So just a quick last question on the yeah. Superman concept. Um, given the iconic nature and you know larger than life he is, yeah. was there a lot of pressure when you had to reimagine the origin or? No, because because I've been I've been in my mind Superman has been my best friend since I was about 15 years old. So fair enough. It, I totally it, it just felt very natural to be able to tell the story. Yeah. Uh, the next one I wanted to refer to was uh, where this is from, which is uh, Heaven's Ladder. Oh, Heaven's Ladder, yeah, the yeah. The Justice League story. Yeah. Um, I actually wanted to touch on that because it was a story that when I first read it, it just completely blew my mind. Well, thank you. Know, you. They, you know, the way they built, uh, stole the planets to build a DNA chain yeah. and give birth to, a, literally to create heaven. Yes. But it's such an unusual concept to have seen. I've never seen anything like it. Like, what made you choose that? Well, it's when you work with Brian Hitch, who was the, the artist. Whenever you work with Brian Hitch, Brian, who works mostly on, he did the Ultimates over at Marvel, he works big. He likes to do, he, 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 he likes giant, huge stories on a colossal galactic scale. Oh, yeah. And actually it was his idea for the very beginning that aliens steal the planet Earth and that's how the story begins. Okay. But then it was up to me to figure out why that would be and, and what came of that. And what, what I always do when I work on a group book like Justice League or Avengers or X-Men or anything like that is I think about the individual characters and I try to find something that some concept or some idea that they would each have a different take on because it creates contrast within the group. True enough. So when you have an Amazon who, who knows the gods by first name and you have... Batman, who, for all I know, is an atheist, if not an agnostic, and you have Superman, who is a god himself, and you put all these characters in, you know, with their different religions and their different personal pantheons, aliens like Martian Manhunter, what do they think heaven is? What do they think of God? What do they think is the afterlife? And that, so I built a story that was able to, you know, they gave me the mechanism by which I could have the other characters sort of come into conflict with each other and explore those ideas. 
I have to admit, one of my favorite moments was not really as much the big scale, but it was um, the Atom asking Superman what happened when he died. Yes. It was just a quiet conversation between friends, but it was what you just referred to. It was the ideology. It was Thank what you. they saw. That's the, so the whole job of writing superheroes is, is you, you're not writing the super part. You're writing the, 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 the human part. You're right, you're, you start with what makes them real people first, and you have to look at the world through their eyes. So if you're gonna, I don't care. There's no difference to me between writing a superhero and writing a normal, uh, an ordinary street person or an ordinary citizen. It, it, you you start from the inside. Right. So okay. Um, so after this, I actually wanted to touch on some of the event stories which you've worked on. Sure. You started with the Underworld Unleashed, which right. was way back. Which is way back. Um, yeah. I think a lot of people here might not have actually come across it yeah. since it's not too. Um, well publicized. It's, yes, not too well publicized. Yeah. It was one of the earliest ones I've seen where you had the, you know, ultimate evil trying to, you know, basically take everything. Yeah. You know, it was an industry-wide, company-wide event. So. Right. But I think, th uh, how did it, uh, DC end up giving this, you know, just to someone uh, as a single writer? Well, at that point, they were every summer they were looking for some big event like that, and I had pitched with my editor friend Brian Augustine. I had pitched this idea of. Uh, basically, uh, the the best the best of these sort of crossover stories, the best of these big event stories, are the ones that that solve a problem for the company. And DC's case, part of the problem was that they have some of the best care the best superheroes in the world. But in terms of villains, once you get away from the Batman group and Lex Luthor and Brainiac, there's the, the rest of the villains were sort of. B and C level. They weren't terribly powerful, or they weren't terribly threatening. So the pitch for Underworld Unleashed was that the devil comes to the villains and makes a deal with all of them to improve their power in exchange for something. And that gave us that big colossal sort of event moment, and it helped elevate all those villains. Um, and I, again, I'm really happy with the way that came out. Howard Porter was the artist who was doing yeah. Justice League, and he was great. And Again, but it, it, like the Heaven's Ladder story, it was about, okay, this gives us a chance to have other people in the DC universe talk about what hell is to them or what, what, they would, what would they be willing to trade if they were given you know, a deal with the devil. Uh, but as a fan of science fiction and yeah. of science, I mean, how, how was it for you to write something which you know, probably had much more religious undertones and a much more spiritual side to the entire narrative? I mean, well, that's a good question. I, I, but it was a little more challenging as a, as a science guy, but also when I was a teenager, I read uh, Dante's Inferno, and it, it, it made such an indelible impression on me, just the, the visions of hell and the circles of hell and, and, and that world that, that stuck with me ever since. So to be able to play around in that and give it sort of a superhero spin was was the kind of weirdly delightful. Uh, um, I'm going to move on to this. Sure. I think you're fairly certain you recognize yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this was, I think, one of the biggest game changers for how DC has been doing comics for a long time now. Yeah. You know, the one year long, a different comic, and yeah. it was this very large collaborative effort. Yeah. So, how was it for you working with you know all those other really big names? Because this would have been a team book from a creative point and cast and yeah. it was huge. You're right, exactly. It was, it was called 52 and it was the, the basic concept was not the writer's concept. The company, DC, decided we wanted to do a book that was weekly for an entire year and would sort of fill in the gaps of what was happening. At the same time, they'd done a, a stunt at DC where they moved all the books one year later. And so this was the 52 weeks in between we were supposed to just fill in the gaps. So it was Grant Morrison and Jeff Johns and Greg Rucka and myself and we sat in a room for two days and really just the good news is we were not competitive with each other there were no egos involved we all liked each other's work and we all just enjoyed working on these different characters so we talked in broad strokes about what we wanted the story to be and we talked about some of the different character arcs and then in terms of actually making it work from week to week, the production of it, what we would do, it was a very collaborative effort. Every week we'd get on the phone with our editor for about an hour, and it would be, okay, well, I'm, I want to tell the Elongated Man story. So 
I need four pages this week, but you want to do the steel part, so you need six pages for yours, and maybe I can, all right, maybe you can have one of my pages, and I can get another page later on. So basically, what you all sort of took charge of some of the different characters all right. and told their individual stories, but we would trade back and forth all the time, too. Uh, um, for, this, for 52, again, um, yeah. I think between you guys, you have a huge dif uh, difference in the kind of stories you tell. Yes. Uh, I think Grant Morrison, even at that point, was still yeah. mostly known for like uh, Doom Patrol and Seven Soldiers. Yeah. Which is a little surreal, a little right. out there for most people. I think Greg Rucker was such a street level crime yeah. guy. And yeah. some Batman, I think. Yeah, yeah. And Geoff Johns was doing uh, Green Lantern. Yeah. So, I mean, did it help to have such a huge, uh, you know, sort of varied type of creative talent, it, or it, was it a difficult. No, talent? it actually helped because, again, because we respected the way each other worked, we, we you know, I think it helped that, it, that each issue of the book. There were always two or three different storylines going on at once, and there were because because Greg tends to write very street level stuff. It had that tone, but then you turn the page, and suddenly Grant Morrison is taking you to another planet, and you're doing something big and wild and crazy. And then you turn the page, and I'm doing something with an elongated man that has real heart to it. And so I think I think it helped because the, it, it kept the book from being dull and repetitive because the tone was just all over the map. All right. Um, before I move on to the next one, uh, just one last quick one. Uh, in 52, one of my favorite things was that they gave Booster Gold a chance to really shine. Yes. But that's kind of, they've scrapped that recently. I think, I, yeah. I think I, that was... I think, that'll, I think he'll, he'll find his way again because they keep talking about doing a TV show with him in the States. Okay. And if that happens, I'm sure Booster Gold will be everywhere. I know he's Jeff Johns' favorite character. So, and Jeff will find a place for him in the DC Universe. Yeah. It means some, him and I have something in common. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, after this, I think we're just going to come to the one everybody knows, which is <laughs> Kingdom okay, Come. Okay, sure. Uh, I, they, this was a huge event. I, I mm. mean, Alex Ross is obviously known for you know his unique style of art. Right. And I think it just blew up. This the series blew up. You know, I think it, it, it real. We were unprepared for how big it blew up, but it really blew up. Yeah. So I just wanted to ask, where did you guys start with the idea of making this particular story? Sure. Well, actually, the the. The basic idea was Alex's. The ba Alex had just done a book at Marvel called Marvels with Kurt Busiek. I remember that. Yeah, and and it was sort of a, it was that same painted style. It was four issues, uh, but that was a, a retrospective look back at the Marvel universe. Alex came to DC with a bunch of character sketches and a bunch of designs, and approached DC about wanting to do something that was set in the in the future. Um, but he didn't. He wasn't comfortable writing it himself. He wanted to see if they could find him a writer. And they talked to a bunch of people, and they put me forth. And we sat down over lunch one day, and I had a couple of ideas. But I knew basically there were uh, what Alex had was a scene here and a scene here and an idea for a character here. And it was very comprehensive, but at the same time, there was no sort of connective tissue. There was no actual, I don't mean this to sound like a slight on Alex, but there was, there was, no, sl there was no real story through line to it. It was an idea still sort of developing. There's a lot of really good ideas, but they, had, they didn't have the glue to sort of hold them together. And so that's something that Alex and I developed together as, as, as we worked. And uh, so a lot of times the ideas would be Alex's, the idea of um, you know, the Spectre and, and Norman McKay, the narrator, okay. being your sort of guide to the thing. Uh, other ideas like Billy Batson growing up and being yeah. Captain Marvel, so that that and being such an important part that may have been my contribution, uh, but we just it was a very collaborative effort going back and forth. Nice. So how come you guys didn't end up working on the sequel, which unfortunately <laughs> wasn't anywhere near as good? It wasn't nearly as good, unfortunately. It was well. What happened was when we got we f we finished, and we were both we were asked to do a sequel. Uh, but we didn't, neither of us felt like we really wanted to do this story again. Um, and we, by that time, Alex and I, we worked well together, but we also have very strong personalities, and we both sort of needed a break from each other for a little while after two years of working so closely together. So DC made the offer. They asked me if I would do my version of the, of the sequel, and then they asked Alex if he, would, if he wanted to do his version of the sequel, and I know he worked on something with Gene Ha for a long time, the artist Gene Ha, and it never came to fruition for whatever reason. But I remember that it was, and this is very typical of Alex and me, my ideas for the sequel were very, very earthy and very sort of rooted in 
humankind, and Alex's ideas were very cosmic and big gods and stuff like that. And uh, that just didn't that didn't appeal to me. But likewise, the thing, the approach I wanted to take wasn't really his cup of tea either, which is fine. So, so yeah. it worked once you decided to you know, leave it while you're on top. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, we, you know, I, I did end up doing a sequel later that was not what e that was not my original idea for the sequel. Okay. Um, called when we call it the Kingdom, and it was yeah. okay. It was okay. It had some. I think it still had some nice moments in it. It just and it introduced things like hyper time to the DC I universe. Um, I it, we didn't have enough time to do it well, and I don't think it turned out quite as well as it could have. But it's you know it's not a bad read. It's just no Kingdom Come. Fair enough. So I'm going to move ahead from DC sure. now. Uh, the other one, which I think people yeah. didn't get to see enough of, was the Amalgam comics. Yeah. Uh, you, and you did uh, Super Soldier, which is Superman and Captain America. Yeah. Which actually, as it turns out, are two of the characters you're most well known for writing. As, as luck would have it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, did, you have, did you really enjoy that? I, mean, I how really was did. This? Well, I, I, it was le the fun of it was less working with as sort of a mashup of Captain America and Superman as it was working with Dave Gibbons, because Dave okay, is yeah. a legendary r artist oh, and Watchmen, yeah. always been one of my favorite. He did Watchmen, and, and he's, he's been phenomenal. So to be able to work with him and collaborate with him was really what made that special. And the other title you did for uh, them was JLX, I think? I think, yes, JL, which that was, that was just a goofy idea. That was what if the X-Men and the Justice League were all sort of mashed together, so... Okay. Do you think you'd ever like to get back to doing more of the Amalgam comics? I don't know. I mean, I think it was a fun gag, but I don't have anything else to say about that stuff. But if somebody else did them well, I'd want to read them, sure. Fair enough. So if we're lucky, maybe one of us might end up doing maybe that. Maybe so. Uh, so um, next up, we can, I'm going to move on to the Marvel comics, which sure. you did. Yeah. And I think one of the earlier ones was on Age of Apocalypse yeah. in 95. Yeah. So, but uh, that was a huge event. I think there was a lot of other people working with you again. Yeah. So how this has become one of the more iconic X-Men events in their entire history. Yeah. So how was the experience working on this? It was it was okay. <laughs> it was it was a, that were a lot more cooks in the kitchen, if you will. That was a lot more of like story by committee. Um, but and I didn't really know the X-Men universe the same way that I knew the DC universe. Uh, but it was fun. I mean, it was I like the fact that there's still callbacks to it and we still do things in the Marvel Universe that still refer back to it. Uh, so um, I think next up we can actually refer to another thing which you are a part of in the uh, X-Men, if you don't yeah. mind. No, 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 no. Uh, this is Onslaught, the yeah. character X Marvel, uh, sorry, uh, Magneto and Charles Xavier. Yeah, or, yes. if you, or if you went with my origin, just Charles Xavier. But Fair it's, um, that was, I mean, it was, uh, that was a sort of a co-creation between myself and Scott LaBelle who was working on the X-Men books at the time. I, and again, we'll never know whether my, I was right or wrong. I always felt as a writer that it was more interesting if Onslaught had just been a manifestation of Charles Xavier's dark side. Okay. Uh, Scott insisted that Magneto had to be somewhere in there as well. And it, I think, it, to me, it made him a more muddled character. But that's just my opinion. But either way, I mean, it, the character, again, that was quite some time ago. The character still seems to have some life. Uh, um, actually, I brought it up uh, because I think, well, you're right that they kind of muddled it up a little bit. Yeah. But my guess is that might have been because they wanted to sort of protect the Xavier character for future comics. I think, I don't know. I, I have no idea. I have no idea. It's also, I think, been kind of a character that's polarized the fans. Some people really like it and some people are some very, really very vehemently opposed. Yeah, exactly. So, um, do you think it really deserves that, or do you think it should be given a shot? I don't, I, you know what, if you don't like a comic character, the good news is there's a lot more of them, you know, True. down there, so you can always like other ones, so yeah. Okay. So, I think we can leave this one behind, okay. and move to actually the one most ah, people here America. know, oh. which is um, Captain America. Yeah. So I think this was in your first really long run on the Marvel On comic. the Marvel books, yeah. But this is, I think, one of the more iconic characters, again, yeah. like Superman or Batman at DC. Yeah. So, I mean, were you? Uh, I mean, what was it like to be, you know, go from one iconic character to another to yet another one? That was huge for me because I was not. I, when I was a kid, I was a DC Comics fan. I wasn't necessarily a Marvel Comics fan. I'd read them, but I wasn't as invested in those characters. Um, but I had two favorites, uh, and one was Captain America. 
Okay. And when they called me and asked me if I wanted to do a Marvel book, they left an answering machine message for me. And it was the editor, and he just wanted to talk to me about doing it some, a series for Marvel, but he didn't say what it was. And it was too late to call back that day, so all night long, I really just kind of sat in my chair and said, please let it be Captain America, please let it be Captain America. So it was the perfect, it was the perfect opportunity. Oh, nice. And I think um, it might have been a bit of a fresh perspective since you weren't as um, attached to it as you might have been to some of the DC characters. Right. You know, it was a new bit of a change. Yeah, and it was, and also, I mean, Ron Garney was the artist, and Ron brought a, a whole new, fresh vitality to the way the character looked, without changing the costume or anything. Just there was just so much more energy and so much more dynamism to it that, it, again, I credit Ron with you know, making it really look special. Nice. Uh, so I think uh, I'm not going to focus too much on Captain America okay. uh, since we're a little tight uh, on time. Uh, yeah. But uh, moving on to one of my favorite runs of, that you had on Thank you. Marvel After Mid was Fantastic Four. Thank you. Uh, but what stood out for me was you, again, like Superman, you changed a lot of things in small detail. In small uh, details, yeah. yeah. Uh, Doctor Doom with his girlfriend and the introduction of how much he moved from just pure science to science and magic. Right. Um, and uh, the Valeria Richards, the uh, daughter of you know, the Fantastic Four, the, yeah. the Sue and uh, Steve, uh, Reed Richards. Yeah. And that both of those things have actually taken and they've carried on and become part of the Fantastic Four pretty strongly. That feels good, so, too. That feels good that I was able to give something back to these characters that I love so much. Yeah. But how easy or hard was it to make such but fairly significant changes to such an established franchise? It's not... I don't find it hard because I just... I honestly think that if you, if you love these concepts and these characters and these, these creations and you just sort of go back and look at their history and start asking yourself how these characters react to different things, I've never had any trouble finding stories to be told that, from a perspective that you haven't yet really experienced. Um, I've been lucky that way. I don't think it's any real talent. I just think it's a, a matter of, I have it certainly a perspective on it that, I, that I'm very respectful of what the characters have been through in the past and I'm very respectful of comics history, and I don't, want to, I don't want to put the lie to any of it, but at the same time, I understand that you've got to tell new stories. You can't just keep recycling the same stories over and over. True enough. But um, how do you find, I, mean, if you, I don't know if you've been following the Fantastic Four for a while now, yeah. but the children, the, you know, the Richards children, they've taken on a life of their own. They have, which I think is great. You know, I mean, they, they certainly have a better relationship than they did in my book. Yeah, yeah. True enough. And I think... Um, Valeria has actually become almost like a leader herself. She's the youngest, but she's smarter than her brother. She's almost as smart as her father. I know. I thought that was great. Yeah. So did you ever think that that would be the direction they would take? I actually did. I actually always knew Valeria would end up being smarter than. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm busy right now in the middle of telling a story that won't see print for a few months, but it's a Daredevil story that's set hypothetically about 15 years in the future. Okay. And I use Valeria as... It, well, in the modern, if I were writing it today, I would be having references to smart people like Reed Richards or, or Tony Stark. But because I'm writing it 15 years in the future, all the references to the really smart people are like to Valeria Richards and so forth. They're like the, nice. And then the 15 years from now, like they're the benchmarks of what the geniuses are in the Marvel Universe. It must be nice to have you know, a character like that just come out of left field and become such a strong staple. It is fun. Yeah, exactly. It really is. It's very, again, that idea that you're able to contribute something back. Yeah. Uh, um, just sort of a last bit before I move on from sure. Marvel completely. Uh, right now you're working on Daredevil and um, the Indestructible Hulk. Yeah. I think I've enjoyed both of those Thank immensely. You. Thank you. But Daredevil's been the yeah. one that's been getting all the hype, all yeah. the big reviews. So, I mean, how was it picking up after um, Brian Bendis and all the other writers yeah. who wrote some pretty hard, pretty bleak Daredevil stories? Well, yeah. bleak is the word. I mean, that's just it. I mean, don't get me wrong. All of the writers who've been working on Daredevil forever have been brilliant. I mean, I don't know a single character in American comics who's had a better run of writers for this long a period of time. But the, the, the thing about Daredevil was that it, because it was such a crime noir book, such a dark, edgy, street-level book, it had gotten to the point where they had done so much to beat him down. Like all the writers had had relentlessly just sort of pounded him with a you know with a hammer every issue to the point where 
Daredevil was still a good book, but you needed to have a stiff drink after every issue. I know became, what you mean. Yeah, it was. It became like, oh, this. Uh, I don't want to read Daredevil this month. It'll just depress me. So, it had gotten to such a point where I don't. I mean, this is just my perspective, and this is the. I know what I do better than other things, and I, I don't do everything well. But there's one of the things I do well is I. I I write very optimistic characters. It doesn't mean everything is shiny and bright, and there's no threats, and there's no. There's no darkness, but I just I believe that cynical comics, that cynical stories are very easy to tell, and I think True they're enough. cheap. And I think it's more interesting to tell stories where there's hope and her heroism and optimism. And so what I linked into with Daredevil, I know this is a much longer answer than you were looking for. I'm sorry. I'm more than happy to sit here. <laughs> they might just kick me off. But what they, they may just a big giant hook comes in and just takes us both off. But um, it's it, what I hooked into with Daredevil is that I saw in him a character who was so mired in tragedy and darkness because he kept doing the same things over and over again. Okay. And to me, that's the definition of insanity. That's, you know, that's the idea. If you, why would you expect your life to be any different if you live in that dark world? It's a more heroic choice to me to get up one morning and decide, you know what, I'm not going to live my life like this anymore. I'm not going to be depressed. I'm not going to be dark. I'm not going to be put upon. I'm not going to be a victim. I'm going to be a hero. Yeah. So, and I think he took a lot of uh, flack from that from the other characters when you started the And series. he did. I walked right yeah. up to it. And uh, some of the other characters in the book said, well, that's not you. And it's like, well, this is, i got to do something. And we've been very lucky. I, again, that's the, the run we've had with so many good artists like Chris Somney and Paolo Rivera and Marcos Martin. Again, I, the book would not have had the attention it had if not for those guys. Um. So, okay, so comic viewership actually uh, is divided into two parts. One part, uh, that is the science nerds, they are more into the causes of something, hmm. why something is happening. And the other part, which is, which is more about the action, they just like the consequence of something that has happened. So as a comic writer, how do you balance the two things? That's a good question. I mean, the, because if you go into too much numbing detail about how things happen or the backstory, it does get dull. But at the same time, if you don't show consequence, if you don't, if you don't actually have people punching each other, or if you don't actually have action, it, 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 then it's just a bunch of people sitting around talking. I, I think the way I keep it balanced is I just always try to remember that uh, in a comic, you, you, you never want to have any one scene Take, take more than two or three pages. You want to keep changing up the scenes and, and having different things happen because otherwise you will get stuck in that rut where you'll suddenly end up with a 20 page comic where it's just people talking about the why of it or the how of it and but you don't actually see anything happen. So just keep trying to change up the like in the back of my head when I'm writing a scene and I get on about page four of that same scene I'm thinking oh we've been here too long I should, I should try to change it up. Okay, uh, I just want to ask, uh, last year Man of Steel came out and yeah. it split the internet in two between people who loved it and hated it. Yeah. So I just want to ask, what's your opinion on it? Are you new here? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I thought, my God, I, I thought I've been so, I thought I've, I, I'm just teasing you. I just kind of thought the entire world knows now that, because that, I've been, I've shut up about it, not at all, and I'm just so relentless about yelling about it. There were things I liked about Man of Steel. And I was flattered that some of the birthright things filtered in. But the bottom line to me is that Superman doesn't kill. Okay. I don't care what the I don't care what the stakes are. Superman was created to do impossible things. And Superman was created to find solutions when ordinary humans can't find solutions. So Putting Superman in a situation where it's it yeah he, he feels like he has to murder someone to win the day, I just find very cynical and dark and ugly as storytelling. I don't want I don't want Superman to to be dragged down to our level. I think we need to aspire to what Superman is. Okay, but do you think that in the 2016 sequel, this this. Uh take on the character can be redeemed in the uh, upcoming movie? It's possible. It's possible the character can be redeemed in an upcoming movie. I, look, I, I will go see, I'm not, I'll go see Superman Batman. I'll go see any Superman movie because I want there to be something good in it. Um, and maybe they will be, but I just, I, I just, 
on a gut level, and this is just me, I mean, everybody's mileage varies, and everybody's interpretation of Superman is what, that's one of the great things about the character. It's, it's whatever you want the character to be and however you see yourself in the character, so Superman's wide open to interpretation. I'm not saying my way of seeing it is the only way of seeing it, but to me, he doesn't, he doesn't need to kill. I just, one final thing. Uh, have you had a chance to see any of the uh, Indian comics around here uh, in Comic-Con? And uh, what did you think about them? I, I, I've, what I've seen, I love. It's so, the Indian comics out here are just so expressive. And there's so much about things that aren't just superheroes, which I love. And the, the artwork is exquisite. And I haven't really had a chance to sit down and, and absorb the stories. But I really like what I'm seeing. And I'll, I'll be going to be here for another, another few days after the show. And we'll be visiting you know, World Comics and, and, and visiting some of the other publishers and, and, and seeing more of what's out here. Uh, do we have time for any more questions? All right, so two more questions. It's All right, two more questions. Make them good. The show Arrow that shows up on CW, they recently introduced Flash. Before the introduction of Flash, the show was more grounded it didn't take on a very science fiction -y approach. It was more based on reality. Yeah. As you yourself mentioned, DC Commerce has you know, uh, a tendency to blow things out of proportion. Yeah. Is, Fla is the introduction of Flash and the way they've introduced Flash um, kind of like going back to their roots? Or is it just like kicking up some dust and they're going to go back? No, I, What's your take on this? I don't know. I'm, I, my take is just I want to see what they do with it. I, I, do, I, do, I do suspect that when they do launch a Flash show out of the Green Arrow show, or the Arrow show, that it, will, that it will probably do a nice job of bridging the tone between Arrow and between some of the more super heroic stuff. So I, I'm, I'm prejudiced in that I know the writers and the producers who are doing it, and they're friends of mine, so I think they'll do a good job. Uh, one more question. Sure. Uh, I'd recently gone for a group discussion. Okay. There the topic for me for the group discussion was, why does Superman wear his underwear on the outside? <laughs> Could you please answer that question for me? He doesn't come from this planet. <laughs> he doesn't, you know, maybe to him, you're all wearing your underwear on the inside, and he's equally as baffled by that. So I think with that, we might be out of time. So uh... I'm, af I'm afraid because I will talk all day that this gentleman has been very patient with me and, and I have, we've, we've run out of time for questions, but in about, in about 15 minutes or so, I mean, I'll be back at my booth over on the other side of the stadium and we can, you know, you can come up and get autographs and we can talk or whatever you need, but yeah, but thank you so much for having thank me. Thank you. I really appreciate it, absolutely. And, so, uh, uh, please, if you would, applause for this gentleman here. And now some applause for me, if you would. So, they, Mark uh, Wade! Uh,